guys, welcome to video four of the Des Moines Engineering University free education series. Today we're going to start getting into AC and I know like, I don't know if you're impatient about it, but I've been impatient about getting to AC, like I really want to get there, but it's been, we really had to, to get a good grasp on some of this DC stuff because AC is, uh, there's a lot to it, it gets really complicated. So We've been trying to start slow. We're going to answer the homework problem from last week's video, or last video three. And this was our homework problem. We had a 12.6 volt lead acid battery here. This 4 milliohm shows the internal resistance of the battery. This is a piece, a 20 foot piece of op gauge copper cable going to our amplifier positive. And this is the ground return path here. And we're guessing that it has also about 2 milliohms of resistance. And we have 200 amps flowing, 200 amps of current flowing into our amplifier, and of course it's also flowing back on this ground path. So the questions were, what is the voltage at the battery terminals? What is the voltage at the amplifier terminals? What is the input power to the amplifier? And then what is the output power of the amplifier? Because the amplifier has a 70% efficiency here. So, if we have 200 amps coming out of the battery, that 200 amps goes across this resistor. So, volts equals amps times ohms. 200 amps, 4 milliohms, 8 tenths of a volt. So, from inside the battery to the terminal, we're going to lose 8 tenths of a volt. And this is 12.6 here. So, at this terminal, 11.8 volts are at these terminals. If you were to take your, your meter and stick it on the terminals during this condition, you'd have 11.8 volts there. Now I have 200 amps across 2 milliohms here. That's going to be 4 tenths of a volt drop. So that will put 11.4 volts on the amplifier positive terminal. Then we have 2 milliohms of resistance in the ground path. So there's going to be 4 tenths of a volt lost here also. And this point is ground, this is what we're considering zero volts. So relative to here, this terminal would be 0 0.4 volts. So across the amplifier terminals, we're going to have 11.0 volts. So at the battery terminals, 11.8 volts. At the amplifier terminals, 11.0 volts. Input power to the amp is going to be volts times amps, so 11 volts times 200 amps, so our input power is going to be 2200 watts. And then the amplifier is 70% efficient, so 2200 times 70% equals 1540 watts of output. And there's the solution for video 3's homework problem. All right, so let's discuss a little bit about uh, alternating current. We need to know about AC because uh, for those of us watching this that are audio people, audio is AC signal. That's what we're hearing. In fact, everything, almost, in, almost everything in nature is an AC signal. Light, the light that we're seeing right now, the light that you're seeing on your computer screen um, is an AC signal. And that's also what makes color. So it has a frequency, just like audio has a frequency to it, you know, your cell for place 30 hertz or whatever. Well, you know, red light has a certain frequency, yellow light has a certain frequency, and so on. Um, lower than red is called infrared, and purple is the highest frequency light, and higher than purple or violet, we get ultraviolet. So, you know, sound is frequency, light is frequency, you know, an AC signal. Um, Obviously, it's the way we hear you know, electricity works this way. I'm trying to think of more examples, but I mean, we might come up with some. But as we go, we'll see that that's just kind of the way of nature. But why do we use it, or how do they come to be like in for electricity purposes? Well, you know, think about we're trying to, if we have some power lines here, here's your house, and here's the uh, you know, power transmitting uh, station over here. This is a nuclear reactor and there's stuff coming out and a little river. 
fish over here with like three eyeballs and the toxins. And here's the telephone poles, let's say, to your house, these electric poles, and then at some point the voltage has to get into your house. So we're transmitting this electricity from the station through these telephone poles and then down into your house, let's say. Well, if we did this in DC, it would work just fine too. Could do that. But, you know, let's say this is a mile. One mile. And, you know, this is just like cable that we use in our car. It's got some size to it and has some resistance to it. And if your house requires a thousand watts, which that's that's nothing, that's like one hair dryer, right? If your house requires a thousand watts and this station is making a hundred volts, well guess how many amps of current need to go to your house? Alright, power is volts times amps, so we're gonna have to have ten amps of current going to your house. Well, guess what happens when you put ten amps through a mile of wire, no matter how big that wire is, it has a resistance to it. By the time you get over here to your house, you're not going to have 100 volts anymore. You might not have any voltage. So that's not going to work. Okay. Well, current is the is the enemy here because it's the current times the resistance that causes the voltage drop. So let's just reduce the current a lot. Well, how will we do that? Well, let's go with 10,000 volts. All right. 10,000 volts, we need 1,000 watts. Now our current is only a tenth of an amp. Okay, well that's probably going to fix this voltage drop through here because a tenth of an amp isn't much. This could be a couple miles long and be fine. In reality, this is probably much higher than this. I don't know. It's probably 100,000 or something because there's lots of houses and your house uses more than this. But anyways, that's the idea. Problem now is that now you have 10,000 volts in your house. So, you know, you can't really uh, have 10,000 volts on the wall outlet. You plug anything in there and you're probably going to die. So, um, it has to be brought down to a reasonable voltage for your house. Well, in DC land, there's no nice way of doing that. You need something called a DC to DC converter, which is an active device. I mean, it has MOSFETs and switches in it. They're, they're turning on and off. You know, it's kind of like... It's kind of like if this was a, a hose coming to your house and you were sitting there turning the, the hose on and off really, really fast to try to regulate this voltage or pressure as it would be in water. So there's not a good way to do the DC to DC conversion. You would have to have an active DC to DC converter like on every device in your house. And that's just very unpractical, especially if you're running like a, you know, a pool pump or an air conditioner unit. You're going to have to have massive DC to DC converters. And, you know, like I said, they're active, that means they have parts, they can break, and this and that. So, that didn't work out, and some smart people back in the day said, well, you know what, if we have a voltage that's an alternating current, that means that, you know, when we talked about DC, we said that voltage is the push, we're putting down like a bunch of marbles in a tube, and we're pushing on them, and then and the marbles come out as the current, well, in AC, we're pushing and pulling them back and forth. And the marbles aren't falling out, they're just moving back and forth. And that you can still get power that way. Right? Because power is just work. And I mean imagine if we had a, a light bulb here and it has two conductors and it has a filament which is just a resistor. If I put DC into here, it's gonna push the electrons, they're gonna go through the resistor and down, they're going to make the resistor hot, it's going to glow, we're going to have a light bulb. Well, in AC, same thing, all these electrons are in there, we're going to push them and then pull them, so they're going to be going back and forth across here, still heating it up and still producing light. So it's the same thing, you can still get power out of it that way. But the beauty of AC is that we can put a little device here called a transformer. And that transformer can, can change this this 10,000 volts down to, you know, 100 volts or 120 volts for us before it gets into our house. So now it's safe and it's easy. We can plug things in really easy. The devices themselves may still require DC, like you plug your laptop in, but, you know, that's what that little power supply is. That's a little AC to DC converter for your, your laptop. 
and it's safe. You know, you can stick something in the socket 120. You're not going to love it, but it's probably not going to kill you. And um, we don't lose the voltage. And you can have many houses, and for each so many houses, they can each have their own transformer or each neighborhood or what have you. And it's a really good way to distribute power. So that's kind of how the uh, AC thing came to be in our houses and that. So let's talk about how we measure it, some of the terms that are used, and what it does in, in audio, how it applies to audio for us. All right, in essence, I'm trying to keep these videos under about 15 minutes each or so. There's, you know, this AC thing is going to take us many videos to get through. Um, today we will just discuss uh, what RMS is, meaning how do we measure this AC signal. But first of all, I just wanted to show you, here's a little transformer here. Pulled this out of like an old CD player. Has two wires in, two wires out. These two here, I'm not, they're not being used, we're just ignoring those ones. But basically I could put, this has some ratio to it. There's a magnetic core and this is wire that's wrapped around the core. This comes in and out of that and then on the also on the core is this. I can draw a picture in a later class. We'll talk a lot more about these, but here's a basic one here. I can put 120 volts in and 20 volts comes out because these windings of wire around the core has a 6 to 1 ratio, just like gears on a bicycle. If I turned it around, I could put 120 volts in here and get 720 volts out of here. But we're going to talk a lot more about these. Okay, so how do we measure this thing, right? Let's say this is an oscilloscope and uh, this is the voltage display. This is voltage here on this graph and this is time on the x-axis here. And I plug this into a, a regular wall outlet in your house and you're going to see the AC voltage. You're going to see this signal on that wall outlet. And um, on our scope, we, we measure this. Okay, this is zero volts, and we read, and we see that this peak up here is about 169 volts, and then back down to zero, and then down here it goes down to about minus 169 volts. But if we take our DMM tool, just our little cool guy digital meter, and we plug that into the wall, it says 120. 120 volts. Well, what's going on here? And that's the whole purpose of RMS. We had to have a way to be able to read this thing because if this was reading in real time, this number, as this signal's going, this number would be going 0, 10, 20, 169, da, 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 0, minus, minus, minus 169. It would be going so fast, you wouldn't be able to see anything on there. So in order to make it useful, in a way that we could read it and relate it to DC, you know, some scientists came up with something to kind of uh, compare this to what DC would be, and they call that RMS. And I will show you how that all works and how RMS is calculated and all that, I think, in the next video, because uh, we're getting a little short on time here. And because of that, I will not assign any homework on this one, and I will see you on the next video.